Hi, welcome to True Crime and Coke. I am your host, Eve. This podcast is about true crime, disappearances, mysteries, hauntings, and anything strange or unusual. I also drink a whole bunch of Diet Coke, and you will most certainly hear my dog snoring in every episode. You can check out my Instagram page at Serial Killers and Stuff, or my YouTube page at True Crime and Coke. And you can also email me at truecrimeandcoke at gmail.com with any questions, suggestions, or any comments. So let's get started. I'm back. So I tried doing one of those short true crime video things and that literally took me longer than it does to make like a 45 minute podcast. So I am back to podcasting. I'm going to take a break on episodes for a while because I am quite busy since I am now a ghost hunter. Yes, that's right. I'm a ghost hunter now. I actually start training this Saturday and next Saturday we are going to go on a ghost investigation and it is going to be recorded through Facebook Live and I'll put the links on my page or whatever if you are interested. I really wish they weren't filming it because I have a problem staying up late and I just know I'm going to fall asleep so that's what I'm most worried about. So anyway, let's get started. I'm sure most of you guys know what a snuff film is and some people disagree on what the exact definition is, but it is pretty much someone being killed or tortured and killed on camera while people either pay to watch or pay for the video. And of course there are videos of people being killed and killings that you can find on the internet, but those are not snuff as they are not being produced with the sole purpose of distributing for monetary gain. But when reports of a video on the internet surfaced of a man and two masked women raping and torturing multiple children and a baby, it was originally assumed to be an urban legend. The description of the video was so depraved that it was literally unbelievable and when it was confirmed to be true authorities all over the world knew that the man responsible for these crimes had to be stopped and on february 20th 2015 an australian man named peter scully was apprehended in the philippines with authorities possessing six warrants for his arrest at first, his story didn't make worldwide news, but as details about his crimes were unveiled during his trial, it became apparent that calling him a monster would be an understatement and his entire criminal record became virtually public knowledge. So before we continue on with Peter Scully's story, let me tell you about the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children and also about sex trafficking in the Philippines. The International Center for Missing and Exploited Children ICMEC reported that a study of 184 Interpol member countries showed that 95 have no laws addressing child pornography in 138 countries. Possession of child pornography is not a crime in 122 countries. There are no laws that address the distribution of child pornography. The International Justice Mission, IJM, has been fighting sex trafficking in the Philippines for over 20 years. They switched their focus to online sexual exploitation of children, or OSEC, or also OSEC, in 2016, and since found the Philippines to be one of the biggest producers of online sexual exploitation of children material. Their study found that 41% of the traffickers were a biological parent of the child, and another 42% were relatives. The average age of the victims was 11 years old at the time of rescue and 9% of the victims were 3 years old or younger. I found many websites about sex trafficking to the Philippines. One website is called dreamholidayasia.com. It was last updated in April of 2020 and it says it is a guide for an unforgettable vacation, a Philippines sex guide for single men, which I'm sure applies to married men as well. And let me read it to you and you can see how easy it is to get sex there. 
If you would like to know the best destinations in the Philippines to get laid and how to hook up with sexy Filipino girls, this guide is going to help you have a safe sex holiday and it is the best way to enjoy the country and beautiful ladies. No need to worry about what to do or where to go after you have read this guide. Most of this guide focuses on the P4P scene, which is pay for play. If you prefer to meet everyday girls that don't work in the sex industry, then use a Filipino dating site to connect. So it is an online brochure and you can click to look at different things. So I won't read every little thing. There are several topics that are clickable. One talks about how it is a big sex tourism destination in Southeast Asia just after Thailand and that men come all over the world. Literally. You can find many of the girls in the red light district across the country, but there are also plenty of civilian girls with a fetish for foreign men and that sex holiday tours in the Philippines are very popular. And this is true. I have heard stories of disgusting men getting in a group together and going on a sex tour in the Philippines. Most of the foreign men are going there for young girls or boys. One link talks about how most of the Filipinos can speak English and how they are easy to get into bed with and it tells you where to find them for companionship or entertainment. Here is a link about typical costs and tips. Okay, so I'll summarize this. The most expensive girls are escorts charging between 4 pesos up to 12 pesos per hour. In the middle range price are the bar girls working in the red light areas and you can expect to pay 3 pesos for 2 hours or 5 to 7 pesos for all night. If you want to save your money and have fun anyway, hook up with freelancers in nightclubs for 1 to 2 pesos. And if you don't like to pay for girls for companionship, you can contact a few girls on a popular dating site in the Philippines and go for a date. How much would four pesos be in American dollars? Let me calculate that for you. 25 cents is approximately 12 pesos in the Philippines. So an expensive escort is charging 25 cents per hour. And this is exactly why foreigners travel to this country to have sex parties and stuff. And it is cheap. It says outside the capital Manila budget travelers can get around on 800 pesos on simple accommodations. Mid-range travelers should budget around 1.4 pesos for reasonably comfortable hotels or simple resort accommodations. Once you enter the top territory, the sky is almost the limit. Top end accommodation prices will almost always be quoted in US dollars. They average around 5 pesos for a resort or hotel, but this can go much higher. Of course, as far as prices go in the Philippines, location is the operative word. Manila's accommodations tend to be pricey compared to the provinces. But bargains can be found, even in Manila. It is very cheap to eat in the Philippines. Street food will cost you about 100 pesos for a meal and restaurant food will cost between 100 to 300 pesos for a meal. While Western style meals at nice restaurants costs about 400 pesos upwards. So it is more expensive to eat than it is to buy sex. The Philippines is also the second cheapest country in Asia to buy alcohol, whether it being beer, wine, or even premium imported brands. This guide also recommends to not arrive in the Philippines unprepared, to make a list or get in contact with people who have been there before or that are already there and know their way around. They tell you that the legal age for sex is 18 and that you are strongly advised to stay clear of anything younger than that and to be aware of street girls connected to the police that organizes scams and to make sure that she shows you her ID. It also tells you about other scams to catch men having sex with young girls. And of course, they're not going to tell you that, oh yes, we offer young girls for you. They do. That's one of the main reasons people go on sex tours there. So anyway, there's just like site after site telling you how to do all this stuff in the Philippines. So you can pretty much get away with everything. Here's another link about a person who is 
talking about his experiences. He says you don't have to go on the street looking for them. You can find them on the internet. There's sex apps there and you can easily just have a girl at any time, nonstop. This person says he has sex with several different girls every day. He also says that they do not like to use condoms. So long story short, Philippines is a huge place for sex tourism and for human trafficking and for young children to be used and abused. I think I have made that clear. So let's get back to Peter Scully. Peter Gerard Scully was born on January 13th, 1963 in Australia. He lived in a suburb of Melbourne, Victoria with his wife and two children. Not much is known about his early life, but leading up to 2009, he was involved in multiple property scams. This cost investors over $2.68 million. He also had a teenaged girlfriend who he had moved to Australia from Malaysia named Ling. He operated an unlicensed escort service and was using Ling as a sex worker. He would also sell her services to participate in sex parties. So he was your all-around horrible guy. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission, known as the ASIC, reported that Scully had been involved in 117 fraud and deception offenses relating to real estate crimes, and they opened an investigation of him in 2009. But by 2011, Scully fled the country before the Australian authorities were able to arrest him. They finally got an arrest warrant in 2012, but he had already left. So the airports were flagged to arrest him if he ever flew back into the country, which is something that he never did. One of Scully's associates who lost $200,000 in one of his real estate scams was determined to track him down. He was able to trace him to the Philippines, but he disappeared into the underworld of sex trafficking. So. How did Peter Scully, a man from Australia with no prior offenses of the sexual type, like abuse or assault on children or anything like that, how did he go from family man to living in the Philippines and building a lucrative international pedophile ring that offered pay-per-view video streams of children being tortured and abused on the dark web? Well, unfortunately, it happened quite simply. Scully operated his child sex ring out of a remote region in the Philippines called Mindanao. He had groomed two new girlfriends, 17-year-old Carmi Alvarez and 19-year-old Lizelle Marjalo. So what they did is take advantage of the poor area that they lived in. There were a lot of struggling parents trying to feed their children. They were also orphans on the street. So what they did is they began offering to help these struggling parents by feeding their children and sending them to school. It was Scully's girlfriends who had mainly convinced the parents to let the children go with them. They were more inclined to trust a woman and they used the same thing when they would get orphans off the street. They just felt safer going with a woman. That that ruse has been used all of the time. There are a lot of killer couples that use having the female as a ruse to lure their bait. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka being one of the couples that did this. Just having a female present in the car gives the victims a false sense of security. So these parents thought this was just a nice foreign man who truly cared for their children and could financially help give their children a good education. And you know, you think, oh, I wouldn't be that stupid. How could these parents fall for that? But a lot of people there are very poor and uneducated. They don't know all about this stuff going on. They think, oh, this is the best for their child. And most of us as parents do realize that would be stupid. But there are still many parents today who are still fooled by people who trick them into believing that they care for their children but are really just pedophiles. They fall for it in America just like they fall for it in the Philippines. So you can't ever really blame the parents, especially when they are so uneducated. 
But instead of feeding them and sending them to school, Peter Scully and his girlfriends used these children to produce rape and torture porn, and he built a pay-per-view business on the dark web where he would take requests from these sick clients who would send him instructions and pay him to act them out. And if you know anything about this case or have even heard of Daisy's Destruction or Dafu Love, you may have heard that it is a video about a baby being raped and mutilated, tortured and killed with limbs severed. In fact, there's several different stories and none of them are quite true. There wasn't just one video, it was a series of three to four videos and the videos didn't consist of just one victim. The videos were about six to nine minutes long. They were posted on the dark web under no Limits Fun. He sold the videos for up to $10,000 per view. Some viewers had to submit their own pedophilia material to show that they were legit. What was the video Daisy's destruction? Well, she was an 18-month-old girl named Barbie, but they called her Daisy. And the introductory scene invited the viewers to witness the mental ruin of Daisy. So what they do while filming Daisy is Scully's girlfriends in masks would participate in the child's torture and sexual assault as a little girl screams and cries as she is beaten. She's raped and tortured and defiled by Scully and his two masked accomplices. Scully uses hot wax, a lighter, barbed wire, submersion in water, and sex aids. They would show clipping of her private parts with cloth clips. They would drip hot wax on her private parts and use the baby to satisfy their own personal sexual needs. They tied the baby upside down and beat her with the rope and other various materials for hours. Another video involved two cousins named Queenie and Daisy, aged 9 and 12. They were the ones taken in hopes of having food, but instead were raped and tortured and held captive, wearing dog collars and chains for five days. Alvarez, who is known as Mistress Scully on the videos, made them perform sexual acts upon each other while Scully filmed it. They were recorded digging their own graves while being continually raped. There were several victims, but the main ones were Liza, age 12, Cindy, age 11, and Daisy, who was 18 months old. Supposedly, Cindy was strangled and raped to death while being filmed and was buried underneath a floor of a rental house. However, there is no proof that that video actually exists. If it does, it would be real snuff. And Alvarez eventually let the two cousins go out of guilt. And it was this event which would finally lead to the capture of Peter as the girls went to the police, leading to an eventual capture of Alvarez and forcing Peter to flee. Alvarez also confessed to carrying out tortures and abuses on some of the other girls. Later, Daisy was luckily found alive, as well as Liza. Although the fate of Cindy wasn't so fortunate and her body was in fact discovered buried in the same grave, she was forced to dig for herself. And according to his girlfriend Liz, he did videotape the murder and even sold it across the globe. It was actually Eliza or Liz herself who was the one who tortured the kids in the videos who came forward and pointed the police to the exact house where Cindy was buried. Dutch police isolated the location of these crimes and Peter's whereabouts to the Philippines and it took another couple of days to identify him as an Australian because of his accent. Peter did not seem like a sociopath or a loner or anything like that. He didn't even look like a monster. He was actually very intelligent and was successful in his schemes and his jail interviews. You could tell he was smart and had a calm personality. He chose his words carefully. In other words, he was completely normal. No one would have expected him to do anything like this. And when Peter was asked why he did it, he said, and I quote, what I'm looking for is the reason to it and what drove me to it. He also said that he was not like that in Australia and even in the Philippines for the first six to 12 months. He was just another common man he said it's 
not like he was a hungry dog who needed to be fed every three hours, explaining that he was not hungry for killing or torturing girls and that he himself was utterly confused with what happened. Now, it obviously wasn't because of money. That might have been a reason, but not the primary one because, as I already told you before, the prime reason why Peter fled Australia in the first place was because he schemed people out of millions of dollars. So he wasn't in desperate need of money, and I already told you how cheap it is to live in the Philippines. In interviews, Peter did not seem remorseful, and when he was asked if he felt remorse, he joked around saying, oh, it's a good question, very good question, well done, and he would just answer questions in that manner. He supposedly tortured and involved at least 14 girls in his crimes. Daisy's destruction videos were so heinous that the Philippines government was wanting to bring back the death penalty just so it can get rid of Scully. However, Mother Nature actually sided with Scully because all of the evidence, including the video camera, the memory card, and all the photographs, pretty much every bit of physical evidence which would indicate Scully were all burnt in a fire. Daisy or Barbie is supposedly infertile for life due to the damage to her sexual organs. I can only imagine what these girls went through and I'm sure there are some that have not even come forward. As of June 2018, he was convicted of just one count of human trafficking and five counts of rape. He got lucky and escaped capital punishment as a result of some political bills being passed in Philippines which excluded rape from being a capital punishment crime. He is serving life in prison in an Australian jail. However, Scully still has access to his fortunes and hey, if he gets a really good lawyer, I mean, is it possible that he could eventually walk free someday? Because of all that evidence that was burnt, there's nothing on him, but police and court deny that that fact and they say they still do have the necessary evidence and that Liz's testimony could still put him away regardless of there being physical evidence or not. So unfortunately this is just one of many 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 stories of human trafficking and sexual abuse that is on the dark web. I'm sure I will have more. That was just kind of a quick little story about Peter Scully. Disgusting, disgusting, disgusting man. Just if you look at his any of his videos, he just has a smirk and a smile. He just doesn't care. So I will end the episode here. Hopefully I will do more soon. And again, please follow me on Instagram under Serial Killers and Stuff and subscribe to my YouTube page, True Crime and Coke, and email me at truecrimeandcoke at gmail.com and look for information about my upcoming ghost hunt. Have a good evening.